It was 1984 when the Breeders' Cup was born at Hollywood Park. Now, the 40th renewal is at hand, just to the north at the great race place, Santa Anita. The event that began with seven races in one day has grown into a two-day affair, 14 championships worth $28 million in purse money, and who knows how much to us. It's headlined Mm -hmm. by the $6 million Breeders' Cup Classic, the richest race in America. We will preview all these races in our seventh annual Hardcore Handicappers episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. And let's go around our cyber room, if you will, as most of us are in Kentucky, one man closer to the Breeders' Cup than all of us. And we're all going to be there by week's end. In fact, maybe even by the time you're consuming this podcast. First of all, from Las Vegas, I I think he's been known to be at places like Saratoga and San Diego and uh, He's the man who runs the DraftKings Sportsbook and will tell us about DK Horse in a little bit. Here's Johnny Avello. Hi, John. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, nice to be with you. Um, you're right, Ronnie. I am heading out to Santa Anita, and from what I saw, the weather's going to be spectacular. So uh, looking forward to a, a weekend of uh, great racing, weather, and uh, a few cocktails. Uh, yes, maybe not necessarily in that order. Uh, we have the man who is the uh, the brainchild, the boss at Horse Racing Nation. He is in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, he's going to offer us some insight and wisdom as well. Mark Midland. Hello, Mark. Hey, Ron. Glad to uh, be here once again with this uh, esteemed group of handicappers. And uh, we had some good success with the Triple Crown, so let's keep that going. And uh, 14 big races coming up, so can't wait. And the man who uh, certainly knows his way around a Breeders' Cup or two or more. And uh, he is uh, in charge of our product and promotion at Horse Racing Nation. And uh, yeah, he's been known to handicap a time or two. Find him on social media at EJXD2. Find him responding to the name Ed DeRosa. Hello, Ed. Hello. Looking forward to... uh... A big Breeders' Cup, Santa Anita, I ran some stats yesterday of the, the frequent hosts, has the uh, smallest favorite win percentage, so hopefully uh, can beat some chalk this weekend. Okay, we'll get into the 14 races one by one, and we'll analyze each one. I do want to mention to you, though, that Santa Anita is not the only place where racing is happening this weekend. I want to call your attention to the fall meet. That's continuing at Churchill Downs. 20 more days of racing, including this week from Wednesday through Sunday. 13 more stakes are on the schedule, highlighted by the signature race of the fall, the grade two $600,000 Clark, presented by Norton Healthcare on Friday, November 24th, the day after Thanksgiving. And the road to the Kentucky Derby prep season continues Saturday the 25th with the Kentucky Jockey Club Stakes. During the Breeders' Cup program Friday and Saturday, there's racing at Churchill, but and it's not going to upstage the Breeders' Cup. You know how you're always complaining about how the races overlap? Mm -mm. (laughs) Churchill scheduled them properly, and in fact, they're going to fall right in between. So if you're looking for a little uh, get-even special or want to let it roll, let it ride, if you will, on a race in between, they will be there, and they will not overlap what's going on in California. We would prefer to say augment, if you will. Uh, The fall meet will be paying out nearly $23 million in purse money, and that's a daily average of more than a million dollars. All purses include prize money from the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund. What that all means is more enticing fields. There's a carrot for the horsemen, and with all those good horses coming in, that's a carrot for you, the better. The races should have more stacked fields and more quality in them. First post time each day is 1 o'clock Eastern time, with one exception, that's Thanksgiving when it will be early at 11.30 a.m. So whether you're going to the track in Louisville or watching live from wherever you are, why not check it out? The fall meet at Churchill Downs. For more information, visit churchilldowns.com. This is the Hardcore Handicappers edition of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. If you're listening to this as a podcast and it's after midday Wednesday, let me call your attention to the Horse Racing Nation YouTube page. Uh, We will be posting there this episode in video form. And if you're already there, this is your invitation to check us out on the weekly episodes of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. They drop every Friday with pop-ups like this one to handicap big races. And you can subscribe at Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts, or check it out in the podcast section at horseracingnation.com. 
Let's get to the Friday races on the Breeders' Cup card, specifically the Breeders' Cup races themselves. It's a five set of races, and we're looking at two-year-olds in these stars of tomorrow that will be featured on a sunny 82-degree day, according to the National Weather Service. So that promise of good weather is looking like it will be made good. The first race of the group will be race five in the program, and that is the $1 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. It will go just five furlongs on the turf course. Two-year-olds, 14 of them, plus one also eligible. Big Evs drew post four and was made the three-to-one morning line favorite on the strength of two group victories this year and maybe more impressive than those, he defeated 22 rivals to win the Windsor Castle Stakes at Royal Ascot. That's the backdrop for the favorite. We got a bunch to choose from, and uh, let's see now. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Ed, you're Mo. You get to start out. All right. Well, uh, I am going to try to beat Big Evs. I already mentioned uh, going to hopefully be against some favorites. More hopefully be right about those favorites. No name Mets. To me, uh, it's important to remember this is a five furlong, one turn race, a sharp turn at that. Very different than what the Euros are used to uh, in terms of their straightaway courses, typically when sprinting. Uh, I actually think that favors the Americans and of all the turf races we have in the Breeders' Cup, I would say the international contingent, probably uh, definitely the turf sprint is not their their ballywick. So to me, no name Mets who we've seen handle uh, the one turn in America and do so with some good figures. Uh, I think we're going to get the right price because I agree with the morning line maker. Big F is a favorite. I'm against. I'm going to take no name Mets. Johnny, your turn. Interesting guy, uh, because that's kind of where I landed too. Now, when I when I look at the and when I give my uh, selections here, um, I may be all over the page on this. I may not go in exact post order because, uh, you know, we got these post positions uh, late last night and we're doing this early. So I, but I will uh, stay on point on my horses. No name Mets is where I landed too. Um, I really do like this horse a lot. And, uh, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to mix some others in here. I'm going to uh, miss waves is going to be, in my exact is um, along with cherry blossom, a 12 to one shots who's been running in solid company. And I'm also going to have uh, one other in there slider. So I'm going to have no name Mets on top first and second using those three horses. Okay. Keying no name Mets two time stakes winner, most recent races uh, in the Tyro at Monmouth and also in the uh, Rosies at colonial uh, back on the 9th of September for George Weaver. And uh, Irod Ortiz will be taking over the ride from Paco Lopez. Mark, are you going to make it unanimous? I am. Uh, no name Mets. Uh, George Weaver has been so good with his turf sprinters all, all summer and fall. Um, and no, no name Mets has so much gate speed. So I, I'm thinking he can outbreak uh, his stable mate, kind of an advocate, break, outbreak big abs. And um, one thing about the European turf horses coming in, I guess they're all turf horses, but uh, the U.S. horses have more speed. So I tend to not like to play uh, Euros that have speed. And that that that's worked pretty well over the years. So, you know, Big Evs, I don't know that he's going to clear no name mats. Then he's got to turn, you know, turn for the first time. So I think that's asking a lot. Um, the one Euro I'm interested in a little bit as a price is uh, number 10 Valiant Force at 10 to 1. So this horse won at Ascot at 150 to one. Um, and he's kind of done this in and out. So he'd finish second, then fifth, then first, then fifth. But did, doing a little research, when he won at Ascot in June, the trainer said, we, we want to go to the Breeders' Cup. We want to win the Breeders' Cup sprint and uh, turf sprint, juvenile turf sprint. So uh, that was the plan from the owner and uh, and the trainer from mid-June. They've been pointing for this race. Didn't run that well going six at Deauville uh, on a yielding course, but I think it'd be worth giving another shot. You might get, you know, 25, 30 to one here. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, when you're mentioning a horse that won at 150 to one, you go, you scratch your head and you keep looking. It's sort of like <laughs> that shiny object. I don't whether it's a wreck on the highway or a shiny object, whatever the case, you certainly uh, want to keep what your eye about on an abandoned car on the highway. Yeah, they have, we have a few of these in Louisville. John, do you have as many have abandoned cars in Las Vegas as we have here in Louisville? I know the answer to that is no. No, that's not true. We have them. <laughs> that, 
they're just they're actually more hidden. I think that's the case. <laughs> Sure, let's go with that. All right, let's move quickly to the $2 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. It's a mile and a 16th, and they will be going off at 540 Eastern time. 13 have been drawn into the field, and this might be the story of Friday. Tamara, the 4-5 to morning line favorite, the daughter of Hall of Fame Mayor Beholder. They look almost alike. Uh, Drew Post 7 carries the momentum and a lasting image of a six and three quarter length runaway early last month in the Del Mar debutante that earned a 91 buyer speed figure from the folks at daily racing form. So there's a lot of hype about Tamara. Johnny, are you buying into it or are you selling it? Uh, not using Tamara. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my top pick is uh, just FYI. Uh, with Alvarado and William Mott as the trainer, I'd like the way this horse is coming into the race. Only two races. they all, None of them have a lot of races. I think maybe three or four at the most. Uh, I like the improvement in those two. I'll be using other horses also in that mix. Jody's Pride and uh, Scalable um, and Candy. Those three probably underneath and mixing my exactas and tries. Mm, okay. Mark? I'm going to go with Candied um, on the rail for uh, Todd Pletcher and uh, coming off a really nice race at Keeneland. Uh, a big close on a slow pace into the short Keeneland stretch going two turns in a mile 16. Uh, I like just FYI. That's my second choice. And, uh, you know, Tamara ran great, but um, she's going to have a real hot pace. She's going to go two turns for the first time. And the price is just going to be ridiculously low. Um, four to five morning line. You know, we might be looking at one to two, and uh, if she wins, you know, applaud it. It'll be be a nice win, and uh, and move on to the next race. Ed, yeah, I feel almost exactly the same as Mark. This feels like a carbon copy of last year's Juvenile, where the Southern California horse was the big favorite, and then Todd Pletcher upset with the eventual champion Forte. Uh, it what turned out to be a nice price in retrospect, and I think we could see similar with Candy getting the better of Tamara, who, uh, like Mark said, is going to be an extremely short price. And the other thing I like with Candy is she has a triple digit late pace rating in her last out, uh, Bristnet late pace rating, which you can see those uh, on our HR and uh, past performances page. We have the juvenile fillies up. But though in my time working at Bristnet, I realized that triple digit for two-year-olds this time of year is a big indicator of a possible move forward, even off a grade one win like that. So if she moves forward again, she's going to be tough to beat and you're getting a great price. I, I don't want to leave the race before we talk a little bit about Tamara. Uh, sure. Even each, we all you, picked against, but. Right. Okay. But how much of that's price? <laughs> well, okay. A Most lot of it. For me. It is for you, John? She's, she's as fast as this group, even on Ragazin, which I really respect. But to take odds on on a filly who's as fast as two-year-olds who someone figures to improve, and if she doesn't, for whatever reason, stretching out, she's vulnerable. I mean, this is a super short price. And, Johnny, what were you about to say there? No, it was all about price for me. I mean, you know, if I if there's no – if they're all going to be the same price uh, in the race, then I'm going to use her. But definitely not four to five, not with this quality of horses in here. Mark, how would you be influenced maybe on a horizontal bet? I would use uh, Tamara defensively with something that I really liked in some of the races coming up. Um, so I would, I wouldn't not ever use it in the, you know, pick three, four, fives. Um, but, uh, you know, in verticals and, and things like that, I'm going to really be focusing on candy and, and uh, just FYI. Okay. And some of the so for this group, the, <laughs> the uh, case of Tamara fever is decidedly at 98.6. So we'll, <laughs> we'll watch this space carefully. The $1 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf will go one mile at 620 Eastern time on Friday. 14 full field plus two also eligibles. And with her two for two record, she feels pretty. Drew Post 11 in the field of 14 made the four to one program favorite. So right there, that suggests a wide open race. Trained by Cherie DeVoe, the former Chad Brown assistant and has been on a real strong streak here this summer and fall. It's a Philly by Caraconti, former Breeders' Cup winner, graduated from a debut win to a grade one triumph September 16th in the one-mile Natalma 
at Woodbine. So four to one for the favorite, certainly better than four to five. If you were looking in that direction, if it does come true, Mark, how are you taking a look at what appears to be a wide open race? Yeah, I agree. It's, it's a wide open race. This is a, a tough race. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, this one where I, I'm, I'm looking to spread a little bit uh, on top. I've got uh, Buchu, um and uh, from a Euro standpoint, looking at the six Porta Fortuna and then the seven uh, Gala brand, uh, another U.S. horse, kind of my price at 12 to one. Um, this is a race where uh, the U.S. horses have done better uh, than the Euros. So that's something to keep in mind. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I I wouldn't have said that right off the top of my head. Glad. Let glad me give you. That. Let me give you the stats. Yeah, that'd just, be great. Super screener does a really good job of uh, pulling that up. And just so okay, in fifteen runnings of the juvenile fillies turf, the U.S. based horses hold a twelve to three advantage. So that's how big of an advantage. Now it will flip in the juvenile turf, but uh, in the juvenile fillies turf. So that's just uh, the type of really good insights you can get from super screener. Wow. Okay. Later. Ed, do you want to see that and raise it? Uh, not. I mean, I, obviously useful information. What she feels pretty. My concern is sort of a wedding funeral situation. I mean, she was six to one on her maiden, then eight to one in the grade one. And now you're looking at one of the favorites against uh, some stout international competition. Uh, Port of Fortuna, I think, is going to be my biggest lean though this feels like a spread especially since I, i'm against Tamara in the preceding race mm -hmm. i feel like this uh if you lean on candied you can you use a few in here but porter fortuna to me uh gets to stretch out looks like a miler pedigree been sprinting in europe but but, but been winning too and i uh, just think five to one's the right price and I, I don't think she'll be much shorter than that so that, that's my strongest lean all right, Johnny, this is sounding wide open, even in conversation. Are you going to go ahead and take it a different direction? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, hard to justify is my top pick here. Uh, you know, Chair Brown trained horse with Pratt. Uh, big jump up in the two, only the two races and a big jump up from maiden special weight to the Miss Grio. And uh, I just think there's another jump there. I think this is a really good horse. So this will be my top pick. I'm going to use a couple other horses, Galabran, who was mentioned, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this horse. It's Lawney, if I believe Lawney. Um, I think French, you're right. Yep, Lawney, the French horse, and uh, there'll, there'll be horses I'll be using underneath. Another horse I may use underneath there is Austair. Okay. If there's an accent at you, it's Lawney. If there's not, it's Lawney. Lawney. I, I just say number four. Okay. <laughs> Quatre. All right. So uh, no consensus on this race. So a lot of food for a lot of different thoughts. So maybe this is one where you want to hit pause and do a little further handicapping on your own. We'll have some advice for you on how to uh, maybe use some tools in that respect as well. The uh, signature race of Friday, but not the last, seeming to be a theme with the Breeders' Cup this year, and that is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And so out of this race, we will have the de facto favorite for the Kentucky Derby. Uh, although, you know, that is complicated by the whole Baffert suspension thing at church. Well, we'll talk about that in six months. But for this particular race, $2 million, a mile and a 16th going the two turns at Santa Anita on the main track at 7 o'clock Eastern time on Friday. 11 are drawn in. It's locked, a gunrunner cold, trained by Todd Pletcher following his 96 buyer from a maiden-breaking win at Saratoga with a two-turn victory this month in the Breeders' Futurity at Keeneland. Drew post six and was made the seven to two morning line favorite. Ed, let me start with you on the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, well, I definitely think Muth is going to be favored. I'm very su surprised to see that line. I but agree. Uh, And I'm e either one can be favored because my best bet, probably of the whole Breeders' Cup, is number four, Timberlake, uh, who I just think has flashed the most talent and I'm going back to 2016 when Classic Empire won this race at San Anita Park. He threw in a dud in the hopeful, came back with the grade one win, albeit that was two turns at Keeneland. Timberlake's grade one win was the one-turn mile in the slop. Uh, but I've already seen some people say, oh, how can you take a big figure in the slop? 
Well, I'm getting four to one on the horse who I think is the best in the group. And he had a big number to run back to anyway that came on a fast track. Brad Cox is happy with the way he's been training. I'm going to be happy with four to one. He's my best bet of the weekend. And what I meant to say when I agreed with you, Ed, is I agreed that I was surprised that Locked was the favorite. Yeah. I thought a Baffert horse would be. I thought maybe it would be Prince of Monaco because you're talking about a lot of the public may not be as savvy as a lot of horse players. They may immediately leap on the 103 buyer, which is the best for a two-year-old this year, and take a look at this horse, even though he's never gone two turns. So maybe maybe the thought here from John White, the morning line maker, is that the Bafferts, there are three of them in the race. It's almost like splitting the vote. Sure. And that, that could be part of it. But we'll see. Maybe there's a side bet on who will be the favorite. I'm pretty sure, though. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think it'll be locked. Johnny, what do you think of the race? What a tough race. Uh, it's not a race I'll be loading up on. That's for sure. Uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go with Muth in this one at this point, if, if Muth six to one, then that's that to me, that was a very fair price. Um, so this is a race. Certainly I'll be using others. I'll be using the wine steward in here. I'll be using general partner in here. Um, so to me, this is a race that, Definitely go a little deeper and uh, could I wouldn't be surprised if a you know twenty dollar horse ends up winning this one. Mm. You have a, which which twenty dollar horse do you <laughs> do we want to like narrow in on? Mark, do you got a twenty dollar horse there that we can win? With? I do not. Um, okay. I, I'm going to go with locked here. It just this seems to be so much speed in here. You know, if you look at uh, Prince of Monaco's forward, Wind Me Up is going forward. Timberlake is is a fairly fast forward horse. General Partner's going to the lead. Fierceness probably as well. Muth is going to be forward. And so uh, I think it just sets up for Locked pretty well. It was very wide at Keeneland. A uh, nice improving horse. A uh, little price play under Locked. Uh, Johnny mentioned the wine steward. Uh, I think he's improving. Could get a nice rail trip. Uh, could get a nice exacta under locked. And then a little fun one, um, the five, the Japanese horse, the Coro Neo. If, uh, if you had a chance to catch the replay, it's a little hard to find. Uh, he comes flying at six furlongs. Uh, it's a little, it's, it's a flyer, I admit, but, uh, you know, 30 to one morning line could go off at 60 to one. Um, if there is a lot of speed and lock wins, uh, you know, certainly I could see another closer running up for second or third. So it would be a horse just to dabble with in, a, in an exacta and more so in a trifecta. So uh, great race. Yeah, we've kind of we've gone from the morning line favorite who we don't think will be uh, to, you know, looking for twenty dollar horses. So we, I mean, this is it's what you look <laughs> well, for. This is what you look for at the breeders. I'll be happy with ten on my pick in there. And what's the deal on the morning line? I, I mean, I hate to be a morning line snob because people mm -hmm. get to weigh into that too much but we've got a seven to two favorite and then three horses at four to one like if if you're doing the line aren't you supposed to like make a choice like who's your second you know what i'm saying like yeah i, I will say this of, john white pretty... he was one of the maybe he's one of the if not the yeah. best morning line writer in the country i'll say that so i think he tends to be true to what he believes will happen as opposed to trying to promote some some depth in terms of the odds yeah, but I I think a lot of people that are sort of like us like i said subscribe to morning line fishing out you know like you don't morning line a horse seven to one that's a rule and and i've always been told like you know you need to pick a favorite you need to pick a second favorite unless extreme example so i think it's pretty extreme to see three second favorites i will say this i made the mistake once of daring to question john white on the air yeah, once about a, a, about a, a price yeah <laughs> i was like we're not gonna get that we're gonna get this da 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 and it was funny because the race that I was talking about, we went back and looked at the chart. And I think of the seven horses in the race, he nailed it on six of them and was like off maybe a point on the other. And I was like, okay, I think I he learned my lesson. You. Yeah. Oops. Oops for me. But I, I but Mark, I will say this. Uh, you've forgotten more than I'm ever going to know on odds making. So, you know, I think I'm if, if anyone's equipped wrong. to, yeah, yeah. I, you're equipped I, to ask the question more so than I've I. I've been taught that, you know, part of the morning line job is to give it, be an indicator, give the public the indicator of who you think might be second. But maybe this is just, he's indicating that these four horses are going to be so close. And, and yeah, I, I can't argue with that. You can't. Johnny, you want to weigh in on the morning line at all on this? Do you even wait? I've been making them myself on different things. So 
uh, you know, you, you just try your best. These guys are usually pretty good. And uh, no, I don't want to go any further than you guys have gone. Okay. What would Johnny Avello know about odds making? I, I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> All right. Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf is the last of the BC races on Friday. Uh, they've been running it like this because you have the three turf races and the two on the dirt. And so they've ended up staggering this to where this ends up being the final Breeders' Cup race on the two-year-old day. It's a 740 Eastern time on Friday. 14 are entered for this one mile race, two turns. River Tiber was the choice of jockey Ryan Moore. And very often in Europe, when you're betting, you kind of see, all right, we see multiple Aiden O'Briens. Which one is Ryan Moore going to be on? He drew post two and was installed as three to one favorite. Aiden O'Brien has won this race five times. That's a record for any trainer in the juvenile turf. Uh, Moore rode this Wooton Bassett Colt to three career opening wins, but then he steps up in class for a couple of group ones, finished third in the pre morning and third in the middle park at Newmarket. Johnny, what do you think about the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf? I like a horse in here, but I hate his post. And that's Carson's run out of the 14. Um, but if as long as the horse doesn't get any trouble early, I think uh, this is this is the horse that I'll certainly be on on the win, win place. And uh, I like Dylan Davis. I like the, the way that he's been, been progressing as a rider. Uh, a couple other horses I'll probably use in here uh, endlessly. And a horse that could actually steal this race, get to the lead, is my boy Prince. Not a lot of speed here. I could see him going out to the front. And uh, with Rosario kind of set, setting his own pace and then getting caught late. Mark? Yeah, it's a good race. Um, yeah, we talked about the the stats on uh, the Euros. Here they hold an 11 to 6 advantage. And as you mentioned, Aiden O'Brien with five wins. So uh, definitely something that you want to think about is leaning Euro here. Uh, I'm going to go with the eight unquestionable for Aiden O'Brien. Um, do like uh, Carson's run of the Americans, uh, as Johnny mentioned, on post 14. But uh, I think Dylan can work out a trip. And uh, one long shot I'm really interested in is uh, the three talk talk for Grand Motion. Uh, 21 morning line could be much, much higher than that. And uh, closed well in the bourbon at Keelan, but got shut off. Uh, Johnny V had nowhere to go, kind of strangled and and uh, lost some ground. And uh, anyway, I think that's a horse that could certainly hit the trifecta or superfecta at, at monstrous odds. Okay, Ed? Uh, this is the favorite I like. I think River Tiber is much of the best of these, and uh, we'll have to prove it. But at, at three to one, uh, I think he wins this race more than 25% of the time. So value to me, and this does end a $3 all turf pick three. Uh, you mentioned the the race order and we have that juvenile turf sprint and the juvenile Phillies turf. And then this, I, I think that's a pretty compelling sequence. And with the three bucks, uh, if I'm able to spread and catch a price in one of the first two, won't have any issue being single to AOB here uh is a is a tepid favorite so hopefully the three to one holds but uh i think he's probably the most likely winner of the five races if i had to be honest all right Ed loving river tiber is one of the three in the field from trainer aiden o'brien for the juvenile turf all right so uh, that does it for this particular part of the breeders cup card as we've gone through the two-year-old races we're going to get to the Saturday races in just a moment, but uh, let me mention that we do have a, a lot of products at horseracingnation.com, and it's not just for the Breeders' Cup. Wherever you might be betting this week, you could use some help in handicapping a lot of different tracks. Mark and Ed, you're the guys who uh, have your finger on the pulse of all this product. You want to go ahead and uh, dip into what we are offering here this weekend, and uh, not only just this weekend, but year-round for those who might not be uh initiated in that ed you want to take this yeah i mean that's the, the great thing about our products obviously they they show up for the big days uh, as we do on the hardcore handicapper podcast but uh like ron they're uh, every week every day of racing there's something for everyone but for this breeders cup mark already mentioned the super screener tons of great info there in addition to mike shuddy's insight you get the angles that go into his insight, so it helps your own handicapping as well. Uh, but then new this year, you've seen it on Horse Racing Nation. We do the fair odds for the big races. 
I'm going to do all 14 races that comes apart with buying the super screener. So uh, that's something I'm excited to offer for all 14 races uh, with the super screener purchase. And then you also get power picks, get some sire stats, track trends, uh, the everything package, we call it, because it pretty much is everything we have. And not just for this weekend, those reports are available year round. So uh, when you win big, like we're certain to do, hopefully you'll be back. Pace report, first timer power ratings, sire moves, hot jockeys, top horses to single, shipper stats. There is no lack of these reports. And let me throw in one more for you too, the post-position bias report. They just <laughs> keep coming when you go to picks.horseracingnation.com. Find out what's right for you. And oh, let me also mention this. If you uh, want to really get on top of all of this, become a pro member. Look for the pro membership tab when you go to picks.horseracingnation.com. Click HRN Pro Reports at the top of the screen, and you'll see the HRN Pro membership on the menu bar. You get all this, and you can see a price that fits you by going there right now. And we'll get into more specifics on the Super Screener a little later on. Before Right now, let me just invite you to go to picks. P-I-C-K-S, picks.horseracingnation.com. It is the Hardcore Handicappers preview of Breeders' Cup 2023. The 40th edition at Santa Anita. Ron Flatter with you right now from Louisville, although the bunch of us will be out in Los Angeles and uh, specifically Arcadia for the Breeders' Cup itself as we wear on this week. And maybe uh, by the time you see and hear this, you already uh, will find that we're there. Uh, also there, here, is Johnny Avello in Las Vegas. You know that he is uh, the guru of horse racing handicapping among Las Vegas odds makers and bookmakers. He's uh, running Sportsbook at DraftKings now. And Johnny, why don't you tell us a little bit about DK Horse? Yeah, DA, DK Horse has been in existence now since March. Um, and it's not integrated with the DraftKings app. You have to download it separately. But it's our venture in horse racing. We it's you know we've been wanting to be part of horse racing for a very long time, and now we are. Some good news happened uh, last week. We are now in California, so we can offer California residents our product. That's really exciting for us. Um, we certainly have promotions and daily specials on there. So uh, if you a lot of content, there's not anything on on our app that we don't take is Hong Kong in the Hong Kong racing in the middle of the night. If you're bored to death, we have something for you to <laughs> wager on. That's perfect. All right. So whether you're bored to death or excited about Hong Kong in the middle of the night, or I would also suggest Australia, maybe Europe, but certainly here at home. And it's good to hear that when we're out in California, we'll be able to use the DK horse app. So if you're looking for that, wherever you go ahead and get your apps, wherever, whether it's at the, a Google Play or at the App Store. If you have an iPhone, why don't you go ahead and hit that, put it onto your phone or your tablet right now. DK Horse. Is that, uh, Johnny, should we say it's wherever good apps are found? Wherever good apps are found. That's, that's a good way to put it. That's a good one. DK Horse. We'll be looking forward to using that out at Santa Anita. Sunny and 81 degrees on Saturday. Yeah, it's going to cool off one degree. Winter's <laughs> coming to California, I guess. So here we go, nine races. Let's get stuck into it now. And we'll start with the $1 million Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. The story of last year could open up this year, and that will be Cody's wish. Remember, he was the feel-good story of last year with Cody Dorman, who, of course, is afflicted and wheelchair-bound, but maybe the biggest fan for uh, this horse who is the 9-5 to five Futures favorite in post three. He'll be the first defending winner trying to repeat in Breeders' Cup 2023. His Met Mile win in June earned him a 112 buyer, the best of 2023 for any horse still active. He's coming off a win in the Vosburg this month in New York. But, uh, you know, if he, they were thinking maybe he could go classic when he didn't win the Whitney. They thought, all right, we're going to pull this back, maybe a one-turn horse. But it's a two-turn mile. Let's remember that, as it was last year when he won at Keeneland. With all that in the Mixed Master, Mark, what do you think? He's one for four going two turns. Ooh. So he's a great horse, great story, uh, not a great bet at nine to five, uh, a worse bet. You know, he's probably going to go off at four to five. So uh, 
here's kick off your uh, Saturday Breeders' Cup with a, a nice price in Algiers coming in from Dubai. Ran great in Dubai, even in defeat in the Dubai World Cup. I think people are going to be really thrown off by that Woodbine synthetic race. Uh, they were looking for a prep race. I think it was in New York that washed out. So they just went up to Woodbine, uh, got a prep there. That's not his best surface. And it was a tough field uh, on the synthetic at Woodbine. Uh, he got his prep in and looked for Algiers to run a big race in the in the dirt mile. And, uh, you know, I'd rather wait for Cody's wish of back at one turn. Okay. Well, you can wait, but I think this is his last race. So All right. there's that. Uh, by the way, it's at 2.30 Eastern time out in California, 11.30 in the morning. It's like Big 12 football. Uh, Ed, what about you? Yeah, Mark took the words right out of my mouth. I, I like Algiers a lot in here. Cody's wish, just tough to back. Uh, the price is going to be. I, I do think it's those two. Uh, we looked at the race with the pre-entries last week, and I had a big separation to my third choice. So uh, we're certainly going to get the right price on Algiers because uh, obviously Cody's wish will take money. And then you have other horses like Zozos who are going to attract attention and uh, the, the price is going to be right. And I'm on the chalk in the next. So this is a, a single for me as a horse who's not going to be the favorite. Simon Crisford, Simon and Ed Crisford. Let me be full there. Uh, trainers, and James Doyle in to ride this horse that, uh, finished a close second actually in the Durham Cup, the group, uh, the grade three at Woodbine back on October 7th. And if not for traffic, might have done even better than that. Johnny? Uh, Cody's wish is that when he was eight to one in the four go, I had him that day. That's the only time I've ever bet this horse. Uh, <laughs> he, he beat Jackie's Warrior that day. And I thought Jackie's Warrior was vulnerable, it was a hot pace. Uh, I have not, like I said, I have not looked look at the prices on this horse. He's just always so short. Um, I, I'll tell you what, so he's made me money. And another horse that's made me money that uh, that I think can go to the front and possibly steal this race is National Treasure. So um, I landed on National Treasure at 8-1. to one. I also like the other guy's picks, uh, Algiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are the two for me at this point. Okay, National Treasure, who, of course, uh, won the Preakness, and that was his most recent time not only winning but in three races since the only time uh, he hit the board. And, in fact, uh, he didn't even do that in the Santa Anita Derby. So uh, you're looking at that, though. But, again, he's coming back to his uh, home course for this one, and we'll see about him for Bob Baffert with Flavian Pratt in the irons. All right, that brings us to the uh, next race on the card, the fourth race, and we'll actually get into the afternoon out in California. 3.10 Eastern Time, 12.10 Pacific for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf, a mile and a quarter, three-year-olds and up. There are 12 in the field, and even though she has not gone past a mile in spiral, was made the 5-2 to two morning line favorite in the field of 12. Star from Europe, star breeding, four-year-old Philly by Frankel, trained by John Gosden and his son, Thady Gosden. Uh, he's won, uh, pardon me, she has won five group one races. Most recently, the Sun Chariot on October 7th in spiral with Frankie Dottori up in post number six. Ed? Yeah, she she's the filly to beat. I'm um, tepidly might try to beat her with some backup since I like Algiers so much. I wouldn't want to lose if Moira wins, who's a personal favorite of mine, but gosh, you know, the Euros are tough no matter what, but all year we've just seen them ship in and win not only grade one races, but they're, you know, dinking off grade threes at Saratoga with what seemed to be their fourth string. So the fact that this one comes over for a trainer who knows how to win in America and certainly at Santa Anita, speaking of John Gosden, and of course, Hard to imagine Frankie not getting one flying dismount over the two days. And to me, this is his best shot. She's the best shot. She's one of the most likely winners on the day. You know, when Frankie was an apprentice at Santa Anita, John Gosden's home base was Santa yeah. Anita before he moved <laughs> back home uh, to England. Johnny? I also like this horse. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, usually not much for real short favorites, but this horse looks pretty outstanding to me. So, that will be my top pick. I will follow that up with uh, a horse, Lindy, uh, being ridden by Gaff Leone. Comes into the race uh, 
off of a couple of really nice races. And other horse I'll add in here, a 15 to one shot, McCulloch. Um, I'll have that horse also in the mix, mix uh, trying to increase the price of the favorite. Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm going with everybody else. And Spiral uh, looks, you know, like a champion type horse. Uh, John Gosden is super confident here. Uh, he's confident that that she's going to get the extra distance. And uh, this is a race the Euros have done well. So uh, let's take on Spiral and get a nice, uh, get a chalk winner here at, you know, five to two would be great. Won the La Marois at Deauville in August and the Sun Chariot, as mentioned, for the two most recent. Last time off the board was on soft going. We're not going to have soft going this weekend. So a lot of reasons to be liking in Spiral in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. The Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint goes seven furlongs, three-year-olds and up at 3.50 Eastern time. Nine are drawn in. And is this the anointing of a repeat champion? Good Night Olive was last year's Eclipse Award-winning female sprinter. She drew the rail and was made the six to five morning line favorite in this field of nine. She won the Madison and the Bed of Roses this year. However, she was a beaten favorite in May in the Derby City Distaff, and she lost in the Ballerina, although to the now-retired Echo Zulu. So it's a little bit more of a complicated story this year for Good Night Olive. Uh, how do you look at this one, uh, starting with you, Johnny? Yeah, look past her. Um, you know, I don't know in this field who can be. There's only one horse I think can beat her, and that's Society. But I just think this... This horse is just too good. His her last race was uh, back in uh, August, so there's been plenty of time to prepare for this race. Uh, so, you know, getting beat in that race by Echo Zulu that's that was just a tremendous race by her. That's what it's going to take certainly out of this field for someone to beat her. But I can't look past her, and uh, and so I think she's the most logical winner. All right, uh, so let's take it to you, Mark. What do you think about the Philly and Mare Sprint? Yeah, I agree with Johnny. Uh, you know, good night, Olive's going to be be really tough here. Um, you know, I, I'm a little interested um, at, in Madureya as if there's someone that can maybe beat her. Um, she did beat her on Derby weekend, uh, although good night, Olive had a little bit of trouble that day. Hmm. So it's kind of like on her best day, she can beat good night, Olive if good night, Olive has a little bit of trouble. So I think that's kind of uh, we're look, looking at. Um, and, and I think clearly unhinged is an in interesting uh, three-year-old filly that's really improving. Uh, I don't know that she can win, but she might uh, run a nice race underneath. Ed, what do you think? Uh, I'm really eager to see where the, the prices land. I think at six to five and five to two, I'm going to take society. Um, it's just too much. I think they're more equal in talent than that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, being on the top two choices isn't too sexy. So I will say that Kristen, Kristen Bosch is uh, a horse who uh, interests me that maybe can pick up some pieces, uh, you know, closer in a sprint. There's a few in here, but at, at 10 to one, uh, I just see some numbers that tell me, Hey, if, if she's running late and maybe splits the two favorites or catch a society and good night, olive wins and Christian Bosch is second, uh, maybe there's some value there, but this to me looks like one of the more straightforward races of the weekend. Okay. As we mentioned, this could be uh, the, uh, the crowning jewel on an eclipse award win and a, and a possible career end if it uh, goes the way so many do go these days. The sixth race is the breeders cup mile and it will be at four 30 Eastern time, full field of 14 and it's Songline, a mare from Japan who drew post 10 and has been made the 5-2 to two favorite. Two grade one wins this year, most notably against males in the Yasuda Keenan on June 4th. Japan didn't have any wins in the Breeders' Cup for all it's trying, then got two at Del Mar two years ago, and now has itself a favorite for this race. Mark? Yeah, I do like Songline coming in from, from Japan here, and uh, interesting that... Uh, they were actually pointing for this race last year and uh, I can't remember the horse had a, a minor issue. And so the fact that they're reloading and pointing at this same race a year later, uh, I think says a lot and uh, look for her to run a big race. Uh, I'm interested in the 11 Kalina. 
uh, comes in uh, a three year filly for Carlos Lafon Perias. I don't know how you say it, but oh, you nailed um, it. He's uh, hadn't really shipped in, I think, to Breeders' Cup a whole lot, but used to ship in every fall to uh, the guard, the grade one Garden City at Belmont, had some success. Um, I think that's it's, he's a trainer that uh, when he ships, you need to take notice. And so uh, I'm, I'm taking notice of the 11 Kalina and, uh, you know, master of the seas got a, a, a rough post on the 14, but I think you got to include him as well. Okay. Ed. Uh, I'm going to swing with, with some local, I uh, can't quite say American cause Cheryl spikes one of them, but I like Casa Creed. Uh, I think he's going to get overlooked between the euros and, even though he has grade one wins on the page, just a, a name, and he ran in the turf sprint last year, people might associate him with that instead of as a miler. Uh, I think this is the right spot for him, and the numbers just stack up too well, knowing that others are going to be bet for me to ignore it eight to one. And then Cheryl Spite, I was up there for the Woodbine Mile, and there was definitely concern about his, you know, being ready uh, in the King Edward, which he got beat as the favorite said he needed that race. They were still a little concerned, oh, he might need this one. And all the chatter was, the point of this is to get to the Breeders' Cup. This is a means to an end. This is the end. And at 30 to 1, I have to gamble that one of uh, the best trainers in North American history has one more in him because uh, this is the spot they've been targeting. And the horse fits with a little bit of improvement off his best. Yeah, that's a big if, but at 30 to 1, you're getting compensated for it. Cheryl Spite for Roger Atfield, Casa Creed for Bill Mott. Casa Creed, by the way, won the Kelso and the four-star Dave this summer at Saratoga. Johnny? I also like Casa Creed. I think the horse has uh, been consistent coming into this race just right, really good now. Um, you know, one of the other horses I like is Master of the Seas, who was also mentioned um, he's also coming in with a couple of really sharp races, actually three in a row. And one horse I was going to use in there as a, uh, you know, to maybe elevate some of the prices of the exact as if I'm fortunate to get one of those other two in is du jour. Uh, du jour's Bob Baffert's trained. His wife owns the horse with La with Debbie Lonnie. Um, you know, Terry Lonnie was a great horseman from Las Vegas and, uh, he's owned horses. I don't know if Debbie is his wife or not, uh, but, uh, you know, he I, I remember Terry as a very nice man. I, and I this horse is coming in with two straight wins, uh, home cooking from California. So a horse that certainly beware at a, at a pretty nice price. And let me ask you, uh, you mentioned the home cooking in California. Let me throw it out for the cyber room. How much does that mean to you here? Horses that are based in Santa Anita, Mark? Uh, it, it doesn't really mean anything okay. to me. Ed? Uh, I mean, at, at the risk of being overly pejorative, uh, things have changed since Mandela won four in, in 2003. California just is not an A circuit anymore, in my mind, uh, in most of these divisions. So the home team just isn't as good. Johnny? That is true, but uh, I always look at it as if you're, you know, if a team's traveling – to London, uh, it takes a little bit out of them. So it's nice to be able to stay home uh, in, in your you know, home confines. And I think that helps a little bit. So um, I don't totally disregard it. And neither do I. And if it's a Baffert speed horse, I certainly don't. If it's, you know, yeah. if it's Papa Padromu, I'm like, well, no. But it, but if it's a Baffert speed horse and went through the sales ring at a pretty high price, I look a little harder at that, more so than I would say, a Baffert at Keeneland, not that he could run there, but you know, you know what I'm saying, right? So anyway, there's that. Uh, all right. From the, uh, from whether there's a home course advantage to whether there's not, and we go to the Breeders' Cup distaff, $2 million is the purse, a mile and an eighth is the distance, 5, 10 p.m. Eastern time is when the post will be going and the Phillies and mares, three-year-olds and up, there are 11 of them. The division's would-be champion idiomatic Drew Post 4 is the 5-2 to two morning line favorite among the 11 entrants. Four-year-old by Curlin, trained by Brad Cox. She's won seven of eight this year, finished second in her only lost, and most recently finished four and a half lengths to the good in the spinster at Keeneland. Ed? 
What do you think about the distaff? I'm going to take another shot with the Chad Brown trainee. Uh, Dunbar Road broke my heart a couple years ago, uh, and he came back with search results last year. And it looks like he's tinkering with the plan. Dunbar Road had run in the spinster to the distaff and got beat a nose. Search results, he decided to lay off from Travers Week last year, uh, and she was a little dull. Uh, so this year, he split the difference and ran in the prep at Churchill in September, and I thought search results looked awesome. Unfortunately, she looked awesome on the front end, uh, which idiomatic is certainly going to make things difficult from that regard. But I just think Chad is really wants to get this race. I know for a fact that Dunbar Road still haunts him. So maybe he and I can both exercise some demons here with search results, who I do think is going to be a fair price because you have idiomatic, you have the Oaks winner, you have some names that are going to attract some money. Uh, and she will too, but not enough. I think she'll be fair search results for me. Okay, Johnny. There's a lot of speed in this race. Um, and so I'm looking for somebody that, uh, would be just off the pace a bit. So I landed on Clarier. Now I know Clarier's last race looks pretty bad, but you know, the personal ensign that was in the slop. So I drew a line through that one. Everything leading up to that's okay. And if you look at Clarier last year when she came into the distaff, she ran into personal ensign and didn't run well then, but ran a very nice distaff running third close. And so I'm looking for Clarier to be close to the pace and uh, if they're all going to go out and duel with each other, uh, her to make that one move there at the end. Yeah, I can guarantee you. If I have money on Clarier, she will lose. And if I don't, she will win. <laughs> she is the inscrutable horse of my recent times, Mark. Yeah, I'm with Johnny. I think this uh, sets up really nice for Clarier. Um, same path as last year. And uh, she ran a bang up race. Remember, there were three noses on the wire with Malathat, Blue Stripe, and Clarier. Not only there, there's no Malathat and Blue Stripe in here, as Johnny said, there's a lot more pace. Uh, if you look at Clarier's form, she's almost never gotten a pace. And she still somehow closes from, from the back and gets into all these races. Uh, if there's a pace here, look out. I think this is a gift. Um, I'm a little disappointed that four to one on the morning line, but you might get higher than that. Uh, I think it sets up for her perfectly. My only concern is just that there's enough pace that somebody keeps idiomatic busy. Uh, for the first half of the race, I think if if you check that box, clear comes running and and gets it. I'm gonna take it does her. seem like she should be higher than four to one, but everyone's picking her, so I'm she might actually be only four to one. Okay. If you looked at offshore betting too, I, I'm I'm kind of with you, Ed. Um, but you know, I, <laughs> it, it seems maybe um, she's become a wise guy horse just in the last you know 45 seconds, right? I mean. <laughs> From that, I mean, in all seriousness, I, Clarier is the inscrutable horse in this field. I, I, that's part of it. I'll give you another one. And I mentioned it with this whole home course advantage thing. Adair Manor. Adair Manor might be the fastest horse in the race. What we don't know is what she can do against a decent sized field. The last five races, the most rivals she's faced is four. So mm. there's that. I, there's, and there's and I, don't think, I think you're getting more than four to one on her, too. I, I think. I mean, she was six to one in uh, offshore betting. I, I think Idiomatic has her covered. Idiomatic's inside. Idiomatic's faster. And uh, the fact that she's been doing well against short fields, there's your answer that it's only going to be tougher for Adair Manor in a larger okay. field. So. I, I, by the way, uh, when the draw was made on Monday, there was a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the Twitter or X chatter that Cox won the day in the draw and Baffert lost basically for part of what you're saying, Mark, a lot of the, where the speed horses were lining up and he has so many speed horses and it becomes an all or nothing circumstance in that case. You agree? Yeah. And then just want to add that Ed, uh, you're a glutton for punishment here going back to the Dunbar well road one more time. Got to give it a shot five to one, not quite the same price, but uh, it's a compelling race. I mean, in addition to the older female up for grabs, uh, probably three-year-old Philly could be decided here, depending on what happens. So this is what uh, championships all about. Yeah, Mark, you know, yeah. if you if you look at it with Ed, uh, maybe it's one of those cases where one of the also eligibles is definition of insanity. <laughs> all right, two, three. And and Ron, one more thing on the price. Yeah. Uh, you know, on speed figures, I think Idiomatic and Clarier lay over the field, so that's that's why Clarier is getting that attention. Okay. 
Ronnie, would you do me a favor, a big favor? What's that? If you're, if you're going to play her, would you please let me know? <laughs> you want to book it? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm on vacation the next two weeks so that, uh, you know, that, that dining out on Crow won't necessarily have to include me. Breeders' Cup Turf is race number eight. It's at 5.50 Eastern time, a mile and a half on the course, uh, and they'll start on the downhill. Three-year-olds and up, 13 of them are in. Mostadoff, five-year-old Frankel horse, one going away. And the Prince of Wales is at Royal Ascot and outlasted Nashua two months ago in the Judmont International at York. Five to two program favorite drawing post nine. Uh, I mean, this one, when you start to think about the race that Europeans are aiming for, you certainly look at this one. The $4 million purse, August Rodin, second choice, having won the Irish champion after a couple of derbies this year for Aidan O'Brien. Ryan Moore will be up. This one, I know Europe is buzzing about this race, wishing it didn't have to take place an ocean away. But here it is. We got it over here in good old USA. Johnny, what do you think about the turf? I think most enough is going to be awfully tough. Uh, so um, I think five to two, uh, I'd probably be in at five to two if that's where that horse ends up holding. Another horse I looked at in the race was King of Steel that the Tories on. So two Europeans, uh, hard to look by past Europeans here, isn't it? Mm. Uh, yes, it is very hard. I don't know. Mark, do you have any of the stats uh, on the Breeders' Cup turf? I, I'm asking you without notice, but I mean, you know, we know this is a I mean, made for Europe race, right? Yeah. I mean, the Euro Europeans domi dominate this race. I don't have the stats, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, Mark, but you do have some ideas on how you might want to bet this race, right? Uh, pretty similar. I'm looking at August Rodin and Mostadoff as the top two Europeans. And uh, those are the two morning line prices uh, favorites. So nothing exciting there. Nothing <laughs> exciting there then. All right, Ed. Yeah. I and mean, most adopt to me over August or Dan, I'd be interested uh, if any matchups uh, show up anywhere in terms of what they would be against each other. Cause uh, I definitely prefer the, the Gosden trainee in this one uh, up to the mark. Uh, I was salivating weeks ago thinking, Oh, he, you know, he's going to be such a play against in the breeders cup against the euros. And I know that the boo birds have been out about the choice to come to the turf instead of the mile. Uh, he has no num numbers that fit. And obviously it, it's a tougher comparison with the euros. So you, you got to do a little extrapolation, but it wouldn't shock me if he runs well and it's, it's a board situation, but if he gets ignored, uh, I would prefer using him over even August Rodin. Uh, but, but I do see Gosden as the one to beat. All right. Uh, so that's the Breeders' Cup turf. Uh, I mean, it's it's always one of those races every year that as we're talking amongst ourselves, I always feel like I should get Scott Burton or Lee Mottershead from Racing Post in here or uh, Matty Playle just to go ahead and say, hey, you know, uh, you're all wrong. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy to go and ride, you know, ride with what we know from this uh, vantage point. What we do know really well, of course, is the field for the Breeders' Cup Classic. We're very familiar with these horses. 13 of them are in 640 Eastern time uh, on a Saturday, a mile and a quarter. And they'll go the length of the stretch first time by and then uh, once around the two turns. And Archangelo, we've heard the fitness questions about him, the shoe issue. Maybe that was a telling point in the making of Arabian Night, the three to one morning line favorite, because Archangelo has been the futures favorite in betting internationally all the way up to this race. With Arabian Night, Bob Baffert looks for his fifth win in the classic with a three year old Colt who has raced a whopping four times three wins and you th <laughs> and you thought last year with flight line it was a very limited resume now archangelo drew the rail was installed as the seven to two second choice coming off his august win in the travers with the belmont win having come before that mark let's start with you yeah nice race um tough to split at the top um i'm i'm not really interested in arabian night so i'm looking inside and uh, i'm gonna stick with archangelo um you know i think uh a great, uh, great three-year-old season and uh, Jenna Antonucci's done everything right. And uh, 
look for one more there. Uh, White Abario, obviously, is a now horse. Uh, there's so much talk about this horse. I think the odds could come down quite a bit, but that would be my second choice. And then also looking at Ushba Tesoro. Ushba Tesoro from Japan. Yeah, I mean, uh, interesting that you know if you say, yeah, Japan, it's all about turf. No, 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 no. Remember, <laughs> Japan won the disc stack with Marche Lorraine two years ago. So, uh, no, no, it's not just about turf. They run dirt there plenty. In case you're uh, not in the know on that, Ed. Uh, White Abario uh, ran the fastest race of the year, at least you know, classic prep type race, uh, which I guess the Whitney's a prep now for the classic. But if if he runs back to that, he's the winner. And yes, there's some questions. Uh, the layoff, the distance, uh, there's reasons he doesn't have to run back to that. But I think he's going to end up fourth, maybe fifth choice in here. Uh, flip side of that is I've seen uh, odds out already uh, from some competitors of Johnny's. Uh, and they have him as the favorite. So who knows how he's actually going to get bet no one likes him but me or at least this bullish so i'm i'm hoping that that's the case when the money actually goes in uh, but he has the best race to run back to and then senor buscador is absolutely my vertical key uh, unfortunately we've lost some pace uh, so a little vigor out of that opinion but he's going to be 30 to 1 and if he can crash the party uh, it's going to spice everything up in a 13 horse field. So white a barrio on top, senior Biscador underneath. Johnny. I was up there for white a barrio's race and I had him that day and had it the exacta with Zandon, who's been good to me in the second position in exactus. Um, I, I do like Arabian night a lot in this race. Uh, the post is not ideal, the 12, but I think this horse is much better, much better than these four lines show, and these four lines show him to be pretty good. Uh, I know he's training lights out down there. My only concern with this race is, you know, what is Saudi Crown going to do? Is Saudi Crown mm. and Jero going to go out and you know try to get into a speed duel with this horse? I don't think so. So I'm, I, I just think that. Uh, that uh, Arabian Knight can go out and either fitness be first or second and and win this race. So at three to one, I think that's a that's a fair price. I'd be I'd be happy with that. How much does the noise about Archangelo impact your opinion of him? Let's start with Mark. You know, I think it's something that you've got to monitor all the way up into the race. So um, that you know, if you are. On Archangelo, which I am at the moment, you, you, I think you've just got to pay attention to the news. Ed? So it, it could potentially. Okay. Okay. Ed? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I, mean, I don't know what he did as we're recording. Uh, there have been a couple days of not going to the track. It would seem like any more of that, and you're in a tough spot. So, yeah, just one of those situations it does pay to pay attention what he's doing day to day. Yeah, Johnny. I mean, we, we certainly learned that in the Derby when we were talking a lot in this podcast, uh, certainly uh, about Forte. And then, you know, he, he becomes a race day scratch and you're back to the drawing board. What about for you with Archangelo? You know, it, it's not like in sports where, uh, you know, a player has a, sure, a sore shoulder and still plays in the game. That's not the way it's going to be here. If Archangelo is right, Archangelo would, was going to run. And if Archangelo is not right, anything whatsoever, he will not run. So if he's in the race, I would not be concerned with any of the chatter. All right. Well, and there'll certainly be plenty of chatter between now and post time at 6.40. And by the way, if you're wondering, the early post time for the Classic with two more Breeders' Cup races to go, it's because NBC, which televises the Breeders' Cup, has a football commitment at 7 o'clock Eastern time. So the Classic is being run uh, ahead of that. And so with that, a couple of races will occur after the Climax. And that's the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint being one of them, the million-dollar five furlong race. Yeah, just five. No, they're not on the, uh, they're not on the downhill. This will be uh, three-year-olds and up, 12 of them, plus four also eligibles, 725 Eastern. Despite finishing fourth in the Woodford, October 7th at Keeneland, live in the dream, the lukewarm 9-2 to two top choice, drawing 
post five, four-year-old gelding based in Europe, finished first in the Nunthorpe, two starts back in York, England. So if nine to two is the favorite, we know there are prices aplenty here, Ed. Hmm, absolutely. And uh, I'm going to shoot for one. I think I picked Christoph Clement in every turf sprint uh, for some reason. Uh, and he's close. Uh, he's, he's got me in the ballpark, but maybe we can close the deal here with Roses for Deborah, who uh, pretty rare that you see this few firm turf races, but a couple goods and then a yielding, uh, which was definitely her clunker uh, relative to her standards. I'm a little concerned with the backward move last out, not typically how I I like horses coming in in form, so to speak. Uh, but I do think there's an excuse there. And when you look at the firm races uh, sprinting on turf, uh, she's easily uh, among the best in this group. And you get the three pounds with her being a filly. And you get 12 to one, at least on the morning line. So uh, to me, this is one I'm excited about. Not uh, to the point where I think she's like the most likely winner or anything, but th the price is right. And if we can get through the classic with, you know, even one of the likely winners, uh, to me, Roses for Deborah is a, a great horse to be live to in the Maltese. Good or firm for Clement undefeated. The one flaw, of course, the one fly in the ointment was the yielding, as you mentioned, in the turf monster on that sodden day at Parks. Uh, what about you, Johnny? Uh, I like Motorious in here, five to one on the morning line. Um, that This is a horse that I will be using uh certainly bet and win place and using in my exact is now there's two horses that I will be using it with and they are both pretty good prices bear can man uh will be coming out of the 14 uh with Pratt riding and big invasion with Rosario out of the one so uh this is a race that I'm looking for a big exact on what are you looking for Mark you know, I, I like Big Invasion a lot here and the way he's coming up to the race. Um, but I'm really concerned about this five furlong distance. And, you know, they don't really run five furlong turf sprints that often. Um, and there's not really that much speed in this race. So, you know, I said earlier, uh, I'm not a really big fan of Europeans on the lead, but um, if Living the Dream runs the race he ran at, Keeneland shortening up to five on a firmer turf course. I just don't see that much other speed. So I've got to use that one. Uh, love the price on big invasion. So I'm going to hope a little bit more on big invasion, but um, you know, I, 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 like I said, I'm just not sure that uh, this race is going to come back to some of these closers. I love the closers uh, that the guys mentioned uh, as well as big invasion. Now that could change a little bit if one time written, he doesn't even have that much speed. You know, there's just not a lot of speed here. Uh, no balls would be another one to, to consider because no balls has got probably the, the the second fastest horse. It's interesting you mentioned Big Invasion. And, of course, on the other Clement. So we got uh, some some Kristoff mm -hmm. power here in this race. Uh, and uh, let's see now. We've got, uh, oh, yeah, one to go. The $2 million Breeders' Cup Sprint, uh, six furlongs on the main course. Three-year-olds and up, 8 o'clock Eastern time. There are nine in the field. Not a big, big field, partly maybe because the reigning division champion Elite Power is back. Drew post eight, nine to five to repeat in this race. He had an eight-race winning streak that was ended when Gunite beat him in the forego. Johnny, is this the crowning of a champion? Or are you going to try to beat him? Uh, the chosen Vron. You know, the, cho the chosen Vron just does not lose. Uh, so as this winning streak of, uh, I don't know what it is, eight or nine in a row, how am I going to possibly go against that, you know, at five to one or more? Uh, so that's where I'm landing on the win end. I'm also looking at Gun Knight and, and Dr. Chevelle in the mix. Okay. Chosen Vron eight in a row and is based in Southern California. A couple of those were turf starts in the middle of all that. And he, he will be cutting back, uh, or no, I take that back. He'll be staying at uh, six furlongs. Mark? You know, it's interesting with elite power um, off of his uh, record and his, uh, you know, win last year, you know, he could be a lot lower than nine to five, but I, I think uh, 
the track of sanity is going to play against them. I think the pace in here is going to play against them. So I think this is a nice shot to, to, to take, take some shots against elite power. Um, you know, I don't like most of Baffert's horses, the, the first day, in, you know, and a half, but this might be a shot where he gets there with number seven speedboat beach at three to one. Um, as Johnny mentioned, chosen Ron is interesting as well. And then I think Dr. Scheibel, uh, who just missed in the British Cup sprint at Del Mar um, a couple of years ago is is one to think about. So I'm looking at those three. Ed? Yeah, the, the, this is the, the toughest one for me because Elite Power has his best is better than any of these have ever run. And he's run those races a couple of times. That was a big step back last out, though, I thought. Uh, Good night is... He has one big race too when he beat uh, Elite Power, but you know they're going to be shortish prices. Certainly, Elite Power will be. So I'd love to be live uh, to a few here. And while we were talking, I, I looked it up some shipper stats for Breeders' Cups at Santa Anita since 2014, and Southern California flat bet profit uh, for horses who last raced in California who then go on to Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita. So that would be 2014, 2016, 2019. Last three editions, uh, there was some home cooking advantage. So uh, I sit corrected on that. And that gives me all the more reason uh, to appreciate uh, a horse like Hoist the Gold. Who it, it, excuse me. Uh, well, I do like Hoist the Gold, but Nakatomi, uh, who shipped to Keeneland, did well based in California. I think uh, definitely can uh, run well here. I'm looking to upset the favorites though. And there you have it from the hardcore handicappers, their view on each of the 14 races on the Breeders' Cup card. But what about an overarching view? What is the best play for each of them? We'll find out in a moment. But uh, I do want to talk to Mark and Ed specifically about the super screener. Available to you at picks.horseracingnation.com. Gents, do you want to extol the virtues of this wonderful tool that was invented by Mike Shuddy? I mean, I would say that uh, it's an invaluable tool for the Breeders' Cup because you've got, you know, 14 races. And, you know, he goes back and, and looks at the, the differences and the trends of each of these 14 races because they're all different. And like I mentioned earlier, the uh, the juvenile turf and the juvenile Phillies turf play differently. And so those are the kind of things that you're not going to know from just handicapping off of uh, the past performances. So uh, there's a lot of great insights. It's 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 just uh, so worth it. And it's something I would never consider a handicapping Breeders' Cup without. Ed, do you want to toss a couple more bouquets into the mix? Yeah, like, I mean, like I said earlier, the big thing for me, in addition to, you know, Mike clearly tells you what he's thinking and how he got to where uh, he is picks and wagering wise. So you, you get both the pick and how to use it. Uh, but being able to see uh, the, the screener variables, uh, the things that went into the process, obviously helps you understand why he made the picks he did, but also... Uh, is very applicable to your own handicapping and can give you sort of that when you're between two horses, uh, you realize, oh, this is the better the better bet and here's why. And Screener lays that all out for you race to race. So uh, not only do you get Mike's great insight, but he helps you become a better horse player too. And to find out how you can get involved and uh, get yourself some of the benefits that we just talked about, go to picks.horseracingnation.com. Click the super screener on the upper left and you'll see an amazing offer. Lock it in right now. And the two day super screener package will cost you only $57. If you've used the super screener before, you know what a good deal it is. And if you haven't yet, what are you waiting for? $57 is all it costs for the whole package right now. And by the way, this is the other thing. If something happens between the time you get super screener and the time the race begins, you get updates sent right to you, so you can be alerted, like when a horse named Rich Strike drew into the Kentucky Derby. Just an example of what you get when you look for the super screener at PICS, P-I-C-K-S, PICS.HorseRacingNation.com. Let's wrap up the Hardcore Handicappers episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod with this reminder. Past performances heard here are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran speed points. 
the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself at brisnet.com. One note, while we were recording this episode, we learned the news of Practical Move, the Dirt Mile competitor, suffering a seizure right near Clocker's Corner at Santa Anita. As we were recording, we did not have a conclusion to the developments in the story. So if you're wondering why we had not mentioned it until now, it literally happened while we were recording. So I just wanted to put that there now to offer you context in case you needed to integrate that into what we were talking about. With that now having been uh, dealt with, we now deal with the best bet of the week, or maybe just a creative way of asking, how are you going to play this uh, Breeders' Cup in, I don't know, 25 words or less? Uh, maybe not 25. <laughs> Mark, I'll start with you. Uh, just first, I want to say uh, thanks to, to have Johnny with us as always. Uh, excited to have uh, DK Horse and in, in, in DraftKings uh, getting further into horse racing, which is great. And, uh, and, and we're also excited to partner with DK Horse to uh, get the word out for Breeders' Cup. Um, I'll keep it simple of... of Two of my best bets of the weekend are uh, Algiers in the Dirt Mile and Clarier in the Distaff. I think those are, are are very likely winners at good prices, and uh, I think if you want to make money, try to you know get those get to those horses in a, in a double, get to them in a, in a pick three or a, or use them as singles and pick fours to kind of build up your value and then spread in some of the other races. So uh, those are two I'm really looking at. All right, mark that one down from Mark Ed. Uh, Timberlake, certainly on Friday, uh, I have no doubt I'm going to get the price I want on him. So he's my my best bet uh, in terms of hopefully a, a nice win bet, singling in the Maltes. On Saturday, a, a reminder, we didn't really touch on it, but there are a pair of 50 cent pick fours that are all turf, uh, alternating. So it's every other race with the turf races, and then they do the same for the dirt. Uh, and I am eager to play that dirt one because uh, I'm going to lean on White Abario. I'm against the top two choices in the sprint. Uh, and then you still have to get the distaff and the Philly and Mare sprint right. Um, but, you know, to me, being against elite power to close it out, uh, I think could uh, hopefully be live to some nice numbers. So uh, the all dirt pick four on Saturday going to be a big part of my play with White Abario a single. No one has been on this podcast more than I throw me out which isn't always a bad idea the next most johnny avello go ahead with that wisdom johnny and uh, offer us what you have for the breeders cup as a big picture play um well one thing about the breeders cup is that all the horses that are running pretty 99 percent of them are all good horses and any one of them can win so don't be surprised uh you know if if a horse wins that we have not selected because uh, that's that's the beauty of having such uh, a you know elaborate field here. Um, the horse that I think is on the Friday that for me is my best bet is going to be No Name Mets. It's not because I've been a Met fan my entire life and had the most disappointing season this year. Yeah. It's because we actually have a horse here that I think is pretty good coming into the race just right with a with a price that's very fair. So No Name Mets is my best play on Friday. And I really think Arabian Nights going to be tough uh, in the classic. It's going to be one of those where it goes out, and if there's not a lot of pressure early, uh, I think this horse is is will wire the field. You stole my thunder on that one. I absolutely agree with you on the Breeders' Cup Classic, Johnny. So I'll give you credit for that. Again, you know, I mean, there's a reason you've been on the podcast so much, and we're happy to have you back again. And thank you to uh, all of you for your insights on the Breeders' Cup and look forward to seeing you face to face in California, even if it is uh, my face. Thank yous again to Mark Midland, Ed DeRosa and Johnny Avello. We have a regular episode on Friday and by then I will be at Santa Anita where guests will be heard from the stable area featuring connections for some of the contenders in Breeders' Cup 2023 and super screener creator Mike Shuddy will have some handicapping thoughts about the races too. Until then, on behalf of the hardcore handicappers, this is Ron Flatter. As Jay Trotter said in Let It Ride, even when you know, you never know. Classic. <laughs>